ጠፋን ባክ እንግሊዝኛ የጠፋ ነው but there's there's a name for this sort of hyper visualization that you're describing mm-hmm. and it seems like some people have it and some people don't to the extent which uh you know i found myself uh, solitary a lot growing up uh you know visiting Addis Ababa and even in Los Angeles so sometimes you know i would create a whole kind of a uh, visual landscape based off all the you know cartoons anime uh movies that you saw i remember i had like my own version of uh, a pantheon mixing like uh the the christian god with the the greek pantheon uh, that i would watch in like hercules with the the norse pantheon that you see in like marvel with thor and and stuff and and I would have all these guys like fight in a martial arts tournament which was very much you know from uh, the Yu Yu Hakusho show or from Dragon Ball Z growing up so i i could uh, relate to that a lot an interesting point about what you brought up it makes me think about the idea of various artists some who consider themselves perfectionists versus people uh, and it is a spectrum of various degrees who are comfortable kind of you have to be at some point comfortable releasing your artwork do you, do you have like a methodology between like when an art piece is just right to be shared with others or is it you know is it different by each piece um i i forgot in this book i read again um it, it says that um as artists it's our responsibility to just put it on the world you know um there's just no such thing as a perfect time i mean for me there's just no such thing as a perfect point in my uh creation where i feel like it's just perfect you know like um, at some point like um, that's just what i came out with and i just put it out there and um i feel like there's going to be someone that's going to see it that it's going to impact and that art was created for them you know it was never for me so i might think of it as being bad because someone might think of it as being a work of art that they can take something out of it so yeah just just put it out you know like uh, it's it's not mine you know as an artist i, I don't owe the art um i feel like i'm just a channel to the creator or whatever it is that is using me as a tool uh because some of the times the things i come up with they never existed in my head they were never inside my head they just popped up sometime you know some day like it was just right there so i'm just sitting down there trying to translate it so i don't know who i'm creating for but hopefully someone will get something out of it so that's that's my thing I just I, put it out when it comes <laughs> i i love that i love sitara when uh, when wisdom is is calling you uh, and the uh, it, it's very interesting i have found personally my most creative moments i had a graveyard shift job one time from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. I don't know why uh, for me my art is mostly writing and when okay. when I was in those moments 5 a.m. 6 a.m. delirious at work at a kind of job where I can just write still on the side I would come up with the most creative writing ever but it would be the worst grammar and I'd have to edit it later um I've heard other people like Nasim Taleb is one of my favorite artists again him more in the writing sense but also in science he talks about going on long walks for like 3 miles or more uh, sure. the kind of more popular thing here in hollywood is to talk about certain drugs and how those may expose you to to thinking differently whether it's um, you know some of the stuff that got recently legalized in Oregon and other places like psilocybin shrooms or or more stereotypically of los angeles is like cannabis right is there a particular routine you do to to get that access to the channeling of a muse to uh, babendetara or or is there no rhyme or reason to to when you feel those moments of inspiration um so right now i i i i don't think uh, i've created for a good 8 or 9 months even the most recent thing i posted was something i created like 8 or 9 months ago but now I, i just feel like um to as an artist you need to clear your head when i feel like it has to be clear um so you're not stressing about uh, putting bread on the table you're not stressing about you know various aspects of your life that need attention and now become when when that happens i feel like it just comes um 
then what comes is the desire to work on it. You know, like on my day-to-day -day life, um, I, I, I'm, I sometimes see it as a curse, but I am bombarded with a lot of image, but I don't have the energy or, you know, the mental space to like actually sit down uh, and uh, follow the journey uh, because there are a lot of things that are pulling my, I, you know, thought and not my creative space. So I feel like the most important thing is Becca, just have a clear mind when nothing's pulling you around. I feel like I create best. And because I haven't gotten that in the past nine months, I'm not creating. But once I get that, then I'll come back to it. Now that's that, how I feel it is. Is uh, uh, Corona Chenefer about this one? What were the things you mean? Negar, no, is 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 the COVID had any effect on your creativity? Is that something that's just coincidental? Um, no, it really does because because of COVID, you know, um, work was hit. You know, like surviving was a bit challenging because it just dried up. So while it dried up, you know, we we have to come up with ways of how to survive. Uh, now, when when you're thinking about your hot, you're not thinking of art, you know. You can't you can't create art with an empty stomach. That's the thing. So like I am, getting a home thing, God, you know, things are looking up, and I have actually started like doing stuff. So right now, um, I will create. I know that that's something else. Like um, I'd like to tell your viewers is. When you live in Africa, uh, we, a, a lot of African artists, especially ones that live in Ethiopia or some other African, con another African, uh, poor African country, um, when they create something, it, it truly is a magnificent feat because they're creating a, that art after they've endured so much hardships. So, like, it, it might it might seem simple, but like just having power, just having internet. Uh, they, they might seem but I'm small again to an artist, especially in the day of time right now. Um, it's just, they, it adds up. Uh, having access to uh, affordable uh, units, system units to create your art on. Um, like, for example, um, on the rig I have, it's, it's but I'm expensive. Again, uh, if I was in the Western world, um, I would have paid it in installments. You know, so it would have been like, what? $59 a month or $100 a month. But when it's in Ethiopia, to get that expensive thing, you actually have to pay it in full. <laughs> so There's no financing uh, in Ethiopia? No, no financing. There's no such thing as financing, you know? So at the same time, everything is inflated. All the prices are inflated. Yeah. So assume we have to calculate it, you know? So we have to find that ba find balance or we have to like line up all those things in a straight line so we can start creating. But in the Western world, you just, I feel like you, if if you have a good job and if you're paying your bills, that's it. You know, if you want to create art, you can just go online, you have your credit card, you can just order whatever thing you want. It will come. If you want to learn something, you don't have to pirate it as we do on our slow connection, but you can just access whatever videos you want, learn a skill, because I like improve your art. Um, or you might even have uh, various communities or institutions that actually support you to do what you want to do. But in Ethiopia, it's like, or in Africa, it just doesn't exist. So when someone posts something on Instagram and they're from Africa, it takes a huge feat to do what they did. You know, but uh, they just so many hoops they had to go through to do that. Even if it's simple, it took a lot of energy. Well, thank um, you for that energy. And that's why I invited you on is to, to highlight an artist from Addis Ababa, from Shagger, from my parents' city. Uh, that is my own adopted city, my home away from home all the time. And uh, what, what's interesting about what you're saying there is a lot of people think that that, you know, again, it's all relative, right? Within yeah. Addis Ababa, like Addis Ababa is the capital of Ethiopia. So if you're in a gutter somewhere in Ethiopia, they have it worse off than you, but you have yes. it you know, maybe worse off than 
one of these post-colonial countries that had this infrastructure laid by the colonists. So they had, you know, the psychological damage. But then after the colonists left, maybe they had better infrastructure. Whereas True. in Ethiopia, we don't have that psychological damage. If anything, we have that hubris, uh, too much uh, zaraf, uh, akaki zaraf yalen, uh, pride. But maybe we're lacking in, in some of the, the infrastructure. Do, do you think hardship, however relative the hardship may be, uh, is, a, is a factor in, in your art in helping you produce? It really is. It really is. I, I feel like if the hardship wasn't there, I, I don't think I would have created it, you know? Um, because like, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but um, you know, when we create art, I, I feel like it's not only about sitting down and doing, um, in my case, pushing the pixels, but it's also about overcoming all those obstacles so I can create the time to actually do that, you know? Um, on top of that, you have all these uncertainties, you know, that are looming around the country, which you have to factor in. So you have to fight all that to actually sit down and create. So, yeah, um, I feel like if we didn't have the hardships, I don't think I'd have been, I've, I would have been able to do what I've done. And I am grateful about it. I do tend to complain about it a bit, but at the same time, I mean, it had to happen this way. Yeah, and in the Orthodox Church, we have a, a lot of uh, jokes, and uh, we use as playfully sometimes. You know, we'll say zekke uh, for uh, zekr. We'll say la fuki la karsiki when talking about that hood or that stomach that you're talking about. But it's it's a very serious thing that uh, in political science, which I have a background in you study movements, and especially when you study elite behavior, whether it's the communists or whether it's the federal Democrats, monarchists, any movement, especially the movements that claim to be speaking on behalf of working class peoples, working class peoples don't have the leisure to be having this kind of telkasa, this critical thought about the, the kind of the workings of their society and the structuring. And so even, you know, in, in the Marxist communist agenda, they had this group that they always called the vanguard, right? And the vanguard, uh, the fita orarioc of, uh, of the communists is the movement to lead the way on behalf of the working class. And then hopefully one day uh, they'll let go of that power uh, in a different sense than you were using the word power of, of literal electricity, which uh, some people got to open their minds to if they don't know the situation. Uh, uh, but they have to let go of that power and get rid of their temporary thing. I have a lot of critiques of uh, the, the actor and former president Ronald Reagan, but one of the funniest things that he ever said was that the closest thing to eternal life on earth is a temporary government program. And uh, I, I, really, I really find that agreeable and hilarious at, at the same time that, that you said the artists have to think about their hood in the first place to get the leisure time mm -hmm. to put in all that energy and gather the, the, the resources needed to push pixels in the hard environment uh, you're talking about. So you mentioned that, that you studied architecture. So this is another kind of uh, debate within the world. Do you go all in on your art, right? This is a, a big, I used to work, uh, I saw uh, my friend Ida Salamon jump in earlier, her, her project that she created and allowed me to hop on with uh, for years was Habasha LA. And our goal in Habasha LA was providing this outlet for creative Habashas like you to delve into their creativity and not feel pressured to just be an engineer or just be a doctor or just be a lawyer to realize that it's, it's okay and over the years, as I reflected on, the, on that project of ours, I said, it's great, but we should also emphasize, you know, the entrepreneurship and, and everything else that would support that, that art. Uh, how, how are you in the debate in terms of, did you go all in on trying to survive on your art alone? Or what do you do for your uh, Latin Jedi? So, did I lose you? Oh, I'm here. Still there. So I studied architecture, I finished architecture. Um, I tried it for like a year. It wasn't me, I was not happy. You know, like I tried everything I can, but it just didn't work out. So I had to stop. Um, 
And now I, I started out as a, a visual, not visual sound, uh, more of a motion graphic artist at this company. Um, I've always wanted to do graphic. I've been hopping from one art medium to another, I mean, digital media for another. Right now, uh, I'm a full time uh, graphic designer. I help a lot of companies. Um, no, um, I would love to just be an artist. Again, I feel like um, I'm not pay for it. People are not paying for it right now at the moment for art. And no, I don't think it's that time uh, to just be an artist. Um, Again, right now, uh, people are looking for graphic designers in this country. Um, back 20 years ago, if you'd asked them, graphic designers were like non-existent. You wouldn't need them. You know, they're opening up to them. So that's the closest thing I have to an artist, to being an artist, but I'm solving design problems. So yeah, that's what I do. Um, you know, like you said, um, once I'm comfortable, then I can start thinking about my art. And until then, it's just difficult. Like th there has to be something else that, I mean, an artist needs a strong support system to do what they do. That's that right. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of talk of, of privilege in, in the United States and especially amongst elites. And that's, uh, you know, one of the running jokes about, um, you know, the fields like journalism or something like that. It's like in order to be able to take like a smaller salary or to get into a field that is rougher, a lot of times when you dig behind, those people had the, the kind of capital or resources in the first place that would let them have a sort of basic uh, stasis for a while. That's why some people in the United States are arguing for a, a, universe, uh, a universal basic income where, you know, the government would just dish out money to everyone at a, at a base level. And I, I've mostly thought against things like that because I think there's a artificial um, mechanism of, of handling the money supply. But what's been fascinating about those discussions is hearing people say, you know, would people be less motivated because they don't need to do anything or would they be more motivated because now they don't have to worry about their hood anymore. And, mm. uh, you know, I don't know the final answer to that. To me, it's a it's an open question. And I, I would love to see, you know, what type of art would flourish in that environment versus this now. And it relates to our discussion earlier about hardship. Mm. Take hardship away. Does that take away art? And, and it's a weird question, especially when we're talking about taking care of people's most basic needs, which is, uh, a value I think most people share. If not, they should. Uh, we, we've kind of talked a lot around this uh, meta philosophy of art, but I want to get into your actual pieces. So I, I wrote an article a couple months ago, uh, and it's a mouthful, but it's titled Afro-Asiatic Archaeofuturism. So mm -hmm. Archaeofuturism is already in use, especially by uh, some Europeans right now, in terms of this idea of looking back at our traditions and yet not being stuck in the past and looking forward to the future. But when you look towards the future, not neglecting the past. And so the languages of Ethiopia, uh, besides the Nilotic ones of the Gambela and the Anyuak, meaning uh, Amarinya, Tigrinya, Guraginya, uh, Harari, Arwoba, uh, you know, Ago, these are all considered Afro-Asiatic. So I took that and kind of combined those. And I wrote this article about the benefits of, okay, you don't have power, right? But now you have cold showers. And modern science is showing that cold showers are actually superior to hot showers in terms of taking care of your health. That's hilarious. You don't have shoes like Tambel Ababa Bakila. And walking barefoot is actually healthier for your foot than some of the modern shoes which claim to have support, but over a long time are weakening you. Uh, a long time ago, people used to call something starvation. Now they've renamed it intermittent fasting. And apparently intermittent fasting is, is healthier for you. So all of these things are, are traditions found in Ethiopia, walking barefoot, fasting, and, and taking a shower with cold water. And modern science is backing them up. 
So I wrote on, on that subject and then I'm, I'm flipping through, as I said, and I stumbled across your artwork. And especially I, I wrote them down here, uh, the sacred, the sacred uh, monks of King Lalibela, um, mm. finally unbound and utterance mm. have spaceships and this futuristic vibe. But when you look at the category in the United States of Afrofuturism, what it lacks, and partly because of that, maybe the history of, of Black Americans in the United States is shorter than the history of Ethiopians in Ethiopia, th there's not as much past. In no, your work, I saw these, you know, uh, it looks like an Abinet Mamher riding on a cloud with Sarbet, uh, a, a priest in the background with spaceships, so much beautiful things. Can you tell me about Utterance, Finally un Unbound, and the Sacred Monks of, of King Ladibala? Because it seemed to line up with the themes that I've been highlighting. And usually somebody's like all past or all future. You're the first person I've seen incorporate like a proud uh, Ethiopian, you know, African heritage of the past with the futurism. Okay. So here's here's my beliefs. Um, um, I don't know what happened, but I feel like our our progress had been hampered. You know, um, I feel like um, if those people in the past had. Um, the proper support to uh, continue on and come to the time we are in right now, or if whatever they were teaching had progressed, um, it would have evolved and we would have come to something we would have called modern uh, in relative to what they were thinking and uh, what they believed in. But I feel like something happened and it just stopped. You know, it never progressed. So with my artwork, what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to go like, okay, fine. How about if that thing moved a thousand years? What would it look like? You know, we're still being using stones, but we're going to integrate whatever was in the Western world. We're going to bring it here and we're going to take a piece of their technology, merge it with whatever we have. And this is the solution, you know? So there's so much in the past that has been lost when that is not being seen again if more people would actually look at it and try to like um figure out where it goes that news we're talking about when that uh, we're talking about would actually help out or god would actually help out to show you what it may have looked like so i feel like it's just my job you know um imagine if laliwala was in the Western world, if it exists in the Western world, you know, how would they have taken it forward? You know, what would Hollywood have done with it? Uh, with all that history, man, you know, we've seen what they're doing with the short lifespan that they have. Um, we've seen what Europeans are doing with their history. They've progressed it. Uh, it does go forward. It does go back. It does stay at the middle. And now again, we don't have that. And now, look out. I'm I'm trying to merge it, you know. I'm trying to merge it and come up with something in the future. Am I making sense? Yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Not... To me, because I'm I'm writing the boat. That's why your art stuck out to oh. me. Uh, yeah. What my, I, let me that's... parse words. My favorite Ethiopian movie um, is actually done by a Spanish director, Miguel yeah. Yanso, and he has the background in this magic realism, this kind of school of Dali. But he appreciated everything about Ethiopia and incorporated it. Have you seen the movie Crumbs? No, I haven't. I've heard about it. I've seen the post of that. It is one of the most that. bizarre things ever. Uh, what is it called? Yaganat Abba or something? Yaganat Abba? Something like that. Uh, the father of Christmas. Uh, yeah. It's funny because not gr having grown up in Ethiopia, you know, I have this uh, Amharic, which is, you know, native and, and, and fluent, but some of those cultural things like I would never think of. I remember watching a movie years ago in Addis Ababa and the whole theater laughed when this guy was making a joke about glucose. And for me, glucose is like this type of sugar. And what he was referring to as glucose is an, what I would call an IV, like an intravenous uh, injection. So like the usage of certain English, whether it's directly, like literally using the English or like translating an English phrase or or weird variations, uh, those things are, are tougher. My, my parents got out of Ethiopia 
uh, before the Derek actually, during the Janahoy's time. And so okay. some of the Amharic I know is older and I don't understand some of these uh, newer cultural phenomenons and I have, I have a phenomenon, I have to, I have to learn it. So yeah. what's interesting about the movie Crumbs is it goes all Afrofuturism, but in the Ethiopian context, it has funny things like someone's burning a ton before an image of Michael Jordan and that's their like Amalak or whatever. And it, it has the spaceships and some of the imagery that, that you have in your work. What makes yours different is that you include kind of the, the clergy, the kahanat, and, and these mm -hmm. images of, of the church. Are, are you someone who, who grew up in the church? And what does kind of the, the church mean to you? Because I see a lot of creatives who delve into the hyper-modernization as mm -hmm. wanting to look forward without looking at the past at all. And it interested to me that you use the word merging. You wanted to merge those things. And yes. your interest behind that is, is interesting to me. Um, so um, I was born Catholic and um, my dad um, actually made sure that um, we, we, we stuck to proper you know, Christian life. And um, so we'll, we'll do Bible studies every night, you know, back when I was much younger. And um, he would make it feel like a Hollywood movie. Like we'll read the Bible, but to, the, to us, the Bible wasn't the Bible. It was just full of flying things. When that's how we saw it as kids. It's because of the way he described it. And, you know, I've always grown up thinking that, um, you know, there, there's more to religion than just uh it being about the soul, um, you know, if, if if we delve closer to it, um, even the idea of it, it, it's just remarkable. You know, I just find it, but I'm fascinated. And um, at the same time, Sundar Lohono, um, growing up in Ethiopia, I'm also exposed to all this Orthodox Christianity because my friends and a lot of my families are also Orthodox. So... I do see it, and they do tell me a lot of stories, a lot of things that all these Kanats are able to do. You know, on top of their religious things, my Luna, I, I just feel like, when I've always felt like, um, if we actually went back and I studied all the books, all the literature, um, you know, stocked up in the British museums, or right now existing at, you know, in the church at Lalibela, I feel like there might be something more than it just being religious um, because, you know, look at what they've done with all these stone structures, you know, um, they still don't know how they are done, you know, yeah, they do have hypotheses, but they don't know how they did it. We still don't have the tools right now at this time uh, that are able to create stuff like that. So I feel like, you know, th there's still some stuff that is hidden that has to be uncovered at some point. And now when they do, I feel like my artwork, yep, I had it right. You know, that's how I feel. <laughs> that's right. There's this uh, crazy haired Greek guy who always gets on the History Channel and people use him a lot in Ancient memes. Aliens. Yeah. Ancient and, aliens guy, yeah. Uh, aliens, he's convinced it's aliens uh, that, that mm -hmm. worked in, in La Rivela. And then of course in, um, uh, the locals will tell you that it is the the angels who worked on the construction uh, project. And there's a uh, Graham Hancock who wrote the sign and the seal and has done other work on Ethiopia mm -hmm. and other ancient civilizations. Uh, he's he's appeared a lot on Joe Rogan's uh, program, the Joe Rogan Experience, and he is the guy who did like the the research on the tablet in in Aksumcion. And uh, he is of the belief that. Like, like what you said, he doesn't know exactly what happened, but he has a lot exactly. of and that's and that's where he gets in trouble. But his basic big idea is that in the past, there were some things that we've retained and there are some things that have been kind of lost to the sand of, yeah. uh, of time. And uh, so, yeah, if your artwork can uncover that, that that's that's great. So... Is, is this going to be a, a theme or a motif that you continue or at different points do you think you'll, you'll, uh, you'll look away? Because I know some people do like one kind of theme or motif for a while and then they yeah. never want to touch it again and they shift to other themes. 
whereas other people have kind of a lifelong theme through throughout their um, their work. Yep. So um, here's what I, I I am doing. What I'm doing right now. Um, it's it's a belief I've had for know, probably ten years now. Uh, it goes something along the lines of. Um, the problems we're facing in Africa is, is more of a vision problem and not like politics or not about hunger. It's, it's, just, it's just the lack of um, image or visuals that people can look towards so that they can use it as a reference to create something better, you know? And I feel like the reason why we are at right now is because what the Western world has created with our true selves, or you know, you can call it our, our soul, or um, I don't know, a lot of people can, you know, but that never said that is not. That is why we are having all these uh, frictions with what they're trying to like show us. Um, I feel like. It is my duty and it is the duty of a lot of artists to look to the past and try to uh, imagine what that could look like in the future so that all these kids that are growing up can grow up being exposed to that so they can um, grow up trying to figure out how to actually create it in real life. So let me give you an example. Let me tell you what I'm trying to say. Um, one of the reasons... I believe that America is where it is right now is because of Hollywood. You know, uh, growing up, kids from the 40s and 50s, they're growing up looking at all these sci-fi stuff where they're looking at all these various actors doing all these incredible feats. Or you, you, you'll see actors uh, performing incredible medical feats, but they're just fiction. But that kid that grew up looking at all those different stuff he grows up, and because that image was already engraved inside his head, he has no choice but to um, realize it because that's what's been engraved inside of him. But you come to Africa, and you have all our kids, including us, growing up looking at poverty. So we're growing up again, repeating that over and over again. But if someone that looks like me like looks like you um, appears with a better visual, better videos, like even books, literatures that put me or people that look like me doing all this great stuff. It, it's like you're unlocking this part of the brain, you know, like, oh, so that is possible. Yeah, that guy looks like me. He talks like me and he's doing this. So yeah, then I am able to do that too. So I feel like it's my life journey, not life journey. It's, it's like my mission. You know, I have to do it. As artists, we have to do it. What you're doing with your literature, you have to do it. You know, um, imagine all those kids that grew up watching, you know, uh, Star Wars or reading Journey to Mars. What are they doing? Look at Elon Musk. You know, they're doing spaceships. You know, it's, it's based off fiction books, but they've actually realized it. Uh, imagine if with what I'm creating, with all these stones doing all this creative stuff, some kid's going to look at it right now, but when he grows up, he's going to go like, oh, the stone have a different property. I, I know this sounds crazy, but you know, everything that we're experiencing right now in the physical world was just fiction a couple of years ago. You know? And now, I don't know, like, oh God, that's my mission. It's, it's to create stuff that will inspire the younger generation so that they can actually take us out of what we are at in right now. Oh, I'm with you. And I'm with you 100%. The binna kana in the church. In fact, we have this wonderful word, you know, we call it talukwa, you know, yeah. uh, but in this context, this talukwa of art is the exact same reason behind what I do, which is why I'm glad we were able to connect through all of the internet connection issues in Addis Ababa and in Los Angeles here in the city of Malaik. And that is, uh, I am trying to, 
like you said, have that representation. Because I missed that, I'm trying to put out there for other people, an Ethiopian guy who is proud of, uh, you know, Amharic and English, all like the whole heritage, and is trying to highlight people in the art world and in the world of science so that mm -hmm. something preter rational can be unlocked in them. It's, it's very funny, especially in the environment I grew up, everything is hyper rationalized and hyper intellectualized. And I don't think it's crazy at all. Like you said, it's crazy. I don't think it's crazy at all what you're saying. Sure. We think that everything we do is fully about our agency because it horrifies us that there are these factors from when we were children, like you said, growing up watching movies in certain sense that trigger something in us, in our lizard brain and the primitive part of our brain that we don't realize that enact mm. us to do it. So by me having this conversation with you and showing people your artwork that is honoring tradition and looking forward, not stuck neither in the past nor the present nor the future, but trying to step out of all of that, zooming out as much as is humanly possible and, and highlighting the greatness to be found in the past as well as the greatness to be found in the, in the future by exploring potentialities. I absolutely believe that. Even some of my favorite history books uh, about American history and Ethiopian history for that, ma for that matter, there is a blending of genres between fiction and nonfiction itself. And so it the way that you said fiction and science fiction and fantasy are inspiring the nonfiction achievements, you know, a SpaceX of Elon Musk is right here in Los Angeles. I drive by it all the time. It's in Hawthorne, California. So yeah. I, you know, he also has the Silly Boring Company where he sells the short shorts and the quote unquote a flamethrower, right? The, the flamethrower regulations say if it has a flame of six feet, it's a flamethrower. So he made it five yeah. feet 11. So it's technically a flamethrower. <laughs> and not, so this idea of humor and art and inspiration and being a muse, uh, 100%. One of the fascinating things behind that, again, I'll talk about Malcolm Gladwell's work. He, uh, he studied in basketball, Wilt Chamberlain, who scored 100 points. When he scored 100 points, it was because he implemented this strategy of what's called grandma free throw shooting, uh, like this. And what happened is his free throw shooting went from about 47% to 87.5% in that game. And so everyone's strategy was to foul him. And that's how he got his 100-point game. He never got 100 points ever again because all of his friends and fans made fun of him with what, what people would call toxic masculinity nowadays, right, for telling him that he's a wussy and all these things for, for shooting like that. Even though rationally he knew it improved his shooting ability, he never did that because of the peer pressure. And so Malcolm Gladwell draws on that research to say different people have different thresholds of their friends that need to be doing that thing before they get to do that thing. I know that my threshold is pretty low and that I don't need necessarily a lot of people that represent me doing the thing before I do the thing. In my head, I just need to know what's right. And I know there's a different spectrum of that. I imagine you're kind of a pioneer in that, in that sense too, but how many people did you grow up seeing, uh, if not pixel pushing, some type of art who inspired you? Like, who were your influences and how closely related to you? Like, were they Catholic? Were they Ethiopian? Were they just black? Was it just the fact that they're a human being? Like, who were your influences and, and what level of representation did they have? And like, is there anyone today that you feel like, oh, that person represents me the most and that person inspires me? Um, I mean, um, to be honest with you, um, my inspiration have been movies. I, I, I do consume a lot of sci-fi movies. And they're all Western movies. I mean, sadly, that's that's what we have available. Again, I, I am so grateful to those that I have um, watched while growing up, like Star Wars. Like, I, I, I love Star Wars, Star Trek, um, all these various sound uh, movies by Christopher Nolan, uh, Spielberg, um, like a... It's like when I see those movies, um, what comes to me is possibilities of what our uh, future or 
what what Ethiopia's or Africa's um, reality would have been if those people were actually Africans. And, you know, how would they have, like, changed this? So, look at that, that's what we have. That's what, that's what I had growing up. Um, so do you, did you have peers who are artists, and if not artists, at least fans and appreciators of art, that you could have you know, discussions with, uh, whether it's even like one best friend or, or multiple people, or, or was this all kind of done on your own and, and in your head, all the visualization you're discussing? It's, it's, sadly, there's no one that pops in mind and, and it's, no one's ever asked me this question and I've never even thought of it, but it just, I think it's just be me. Like I do have friends that are artists. I mean, after I've grown up, um, and I, I do like uh, appreciate uh, what they have like put on me again. It's just, I'm just alone. Like, it's so sad. Like, you just make, you're just making me realize this. I, I have no one. I have no one, man. There's no one I can actually say that about. I mean, my dad's an architect. I, 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 I yeah, like, I did grow up looking at him, scratch a lot, draw a lot. Honestly, um, there was this one spaceship that I did, and I'm coming clean, but his catch was actually what had inspired me back then. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Um, G-Box Creative, I don't know if he's listening to this. Um, we, we met like a couple of years ago. Um, we do talk a lot. Um, what else than that? Growing up, it's just been a long, lonely journey. Well, yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to make you sad or go into Tikkazi, but it's a good thing to, to critically reflect on and, I, and appreciate the openness and, and, and you figuring it out. I, I do think that the interaction with other people, because again, people are on a spectrum with different thresholds necessary of their friends to do it, inspires people differently. But it's, it's fascinating. There's, there are different theories of history and sometimes the, the theories of history are pushed by someone's political perspective. Yeah. The kind of standard argument, and, and these things are so loose, so it's, it's hard to pin people down. But the kind of standard argument people have is like if someone is left-wing, that the idea is that they believe that it's all factors and systems that are at work. And if somebody is right-wing, that it's all about the individuals. It's, it's what people call as the great man history or the great men history, theory of history. Not, uh, I've always felt like both of those things are confining, which is again, goes back to this Afro-Asiatic archaeofuturism that we're kind of discussing, is that I've always kind of found myself in the center of that, but not in the center in a boring way, always in a, in a radical way or in an alternative way because there are centrists who are uh, more milk toast, and that's not what I'm talking about. So, you know, to flip the script and hopefully not end on, on uh, Tik Kazi, what, what I'm trying to say is, uh, you know, it, it may be a sign of greatness within you that you have been able to do this alone. So in, in one sense, it's, you know, it sounds lonely or sad, but in another sense, it, you know, it, it, it may be a sign of greatness that you are able to work through the hardship and, and, and being solitary. And, you know, you said you're 35. Uh, you, you have a long life ahead of you, Lord willing. I do, indeed. Right? So many surprises to come. It's not done yet. <laughs> yeah, you have. I mean, uh, think about it. Like, you have so many decades potentially left to yeah. see or collaborate. And you said you, you found a, a recent collaborator or at least someone to discuss stuff with. Yeah. Um, so one of my friends is G-Box, uh, Girma, Girma Berta. Um, we do talk a lot about this. Someone else is my girl. Uh, as it happens, she is an IT graduate and she does, she is into by me soon to be fiance, um, which I am going to marry. Um, 
about you. <laughs> she thank you. Uh, and now she does understand it. She, you know, I do bounce off ideas off of her. Um, it's just that I haven't done that in, in, I mean, especially when it comes to my artwork, I haven't done that in such a long time. Okay? Um, I think her and him are probably the two most, uh, you know, important people of recently that I've done this with. Um, again, you also have to understand, uh, working with other people is something you learn, you know, somewhere. I, I feel like the reason why I've been alone is because there hasn't been anywhere that teaches us to do this kind of stuff. I mean, interacting with each other and collaborating. Like, if you ask me to collaborate, I don't know how to collaborate. No one's told me how to collaborate, you know? Like, when, when, when you collaborate, it doesn't mean you just sh shut up and let the other person do whatever it is, or do they shut up, you know? It's like, because, I don't know, like... So, that uh, there's still a long time to go, and, yeah, if it does come to my... Uh, if it does come on my path. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that would be funny. There's a, there's a danger here on the other side too, right? And the danger, I've actually written about this in the, in the past. And uh, I lead a Bible study actually weekly. And I tell my Bible study people and I crack them up about it all the time. But for those who believe in the Bible and uh, who either live in the Western world or idealize the Western world, it's going to be a funny thing that they run into. And that is the Bible is very anti-democratic. And so everyone loves the words like democracy and consensus and things like that. But, uh, you know, uh, for example, the silliest examples that I always give people, you have Barabbas, which in Arab Aramaic means the son of the father. And he's a physical insurrectionist. He wants to lead a rebellion. He's part of a group called the Zealots. And you have Jesus, who's also the son of the father. And they're put to a vote and which one gets released and which one gets crucified. Uh, sure. You go other parts and you see, you know, in Islam, there's this debate about whether it's people related to the prophet Muhammad or is it people that you vote on. In Christianity, there was no debate, although this is a big difference between the high churches like the Catholic Church and, and the Orthodox Church versus Protestantism. Uh, mm -hmm. Jesus did not say vote on who the apostles are. He chose, he handpicked them. And then when the apostles left, they didn't say, okay, take a vote on who gets to be bishop. They hand selected all the people who became bishops, priests, and deacons. And that process is called apostolic secession. And that's one thing that's common to the, to the Roman Catholic Church, to the Greek Orthodox, to our Afro-Asiatic Orthodox, and to the East Syriac, who are called the, the Church of the East. All four of those major branches of Christianity have this hand-picked fashion now they argue about you know where where did this uh you know sever down the line but the bible is very anti-democratic in a number of places and part of that is that collaboration doesn't mean you have to make every decision by committee in fact when you try to make every decision by committee you're going to find that not a lot of art uh you know comes about in the first place so certainly i would i would never encourage uh, death by committee to your artwork because i want to see your artwork continue to flourish and and i hope that that you you collaborate if and when you only want to on your terms and that you always retain your decision making because i think when you retain your decision making that's when you're going to be motivated and, and interested in all that true true i agree with you <laughs> i don't know <laughs> we'll see what happens <laughs> uh to nylon um, so it's been a pleasure. I see uh, some, of, some of the people in the audience are writing to us. I don't know if you see it on your end too. Yes, saying, I do. Yes, do this weekly. So this is already one collaboration that we've done. Who knows what the future will bring. But one thing I'll tell you is mm -hmm. uh, as far as my space and the creative space that I'm working in, I grew up on Star Wars to, lesser, uh, to a lesser extent Star Trek, although I've seen you know, a Star Trek film and random episodes of Star, uh, Star Trek, mostly Star Wars. But I also grew up a voracious reader and everything in, in sci-fi and fantasy, like I, I ate it up. And so if you ever I want to do a sci-fi or fantasy book or a sci-fi or fantasy uh, video game 
or any movies, uh, you always this channel is open. You just hit me up and let me know what you want to review, and we could review something uh, together. And that that will be continuing the conversation un until you have uh, more art pieces for us. I'd love to. Man. There's this book like um, the Three Body Problem. Have you heard of it? The Three Body Problem. Netflix is about to change into a series. Tell me about it. I'm not familiar. The Three Body Problem. It's by this Chinese uh, sci-fi author. Um, it's pretty trippy, man. Like the stuff he puts out there. Like it, it's something I, I can't even describe it. But like I hope you get to read it and we get to review it together because. Um, should I spoil it for you, or I mean, should I just <laughs> don't spoil it? I, I, mean, I don't you know what? I rather you read it. Kazala would review it. I, I feel like if you ever get to read that, I would love to review it with you. Trippiest thing I've ever read in my life, and I'm still stuck on part of the books, and I'm just going like, oh my god, like what kind of head created this? Like, there's this part on his second book where he's um he's he's trying to like describe the conversation of two people from an ant's point of view, you know, from an ant's point of view. And there's the whole galaxy, there's the whole stars that is painted very vividly. And these people are talking, but at the same time, this ant is on this graveyard, um, what do you call it? It's on a grave, a tombstone. And she's describing how she feels about numbers. You know, what, what numbers feel to an ant? how seven feels, how eight feels. Uh, and at the same time, um, those people that she is witnessing are changing the course of humanity for, you know, for the rest of our lives. And now nah, it's, it's just, if you ever get to read it, The Three Body Problem, let me know. I would love to read it. You, and David said I was a Joanlo. It's, it's homework uh, for sure. Uh, three body problem. I'm, I'm going to look into it because I would love to do that. And I encourage on my channel, especially, you know, once uh, I'm, I'm close to a thousand subscribers on YouTube. And once I get there, I will be doing regularly live programs, kind of like we're doing live now on, on Instagram. And I would love to do just reviews of everything in art. And so definitely it sounds like our, our interests aligned and the big theme without having seen the movie or without having read the book, the big theme that I could already see as a connection and a further point of discussion when we get to this is what I try to do. You know, I grew up in a very progressive environment in Los Angeles, uh, you know, and so for me, you know, obviously from the beginning, you know, Fox News are the bad guys, but as I grew older, I got really bothered by people who would say, for example, in Christianity, I don't have a branch. I'm non-denominational. In politics, I don't have a politics. I'm non-partisan. I'm non-biased. And I saw that with NPR, with National Public Radio, and with CNN, which are two of the sources that basically raised me, you know, two of my parents' favorite things. And it bugged me. So what I like to do, pun intended, bugged, because you're talking about ants, is with any work that I do, if things appear simple for people, I want them to appear slightly more complex. I want to zoom out a little bit more. Game of Thrones and The Watchmen are two of my favorite series. And I think two of the things that they did very well, although the end of Game of Thrones, without spoiling it, made things a little bit more black and white, is that they had a whole lot of gray, which left room for us to have to think about it and, and reflect more about, you know, there are heroes and there are anti-heroes, there are villains and maybe anti-villains that, that defy the kind of uh, normal good and evil categories that we uh, as children of, uh, and disciples of Plato are always trying to do, is always trying to enforce good and evil. It's what Adam and Eve did when they tried to eat the fruit. And when they did, is they wanted to know about good and evil and, and lay it out True. cleanly. God's like, no, you can't quite lay it out that cleanly. So um, I could already see us getting into into that discussion do you have any kind of final thoughts or or parting words whether it be advice to to other artists who are uh, along the way or 
or any final things you want to plug, now would be a, a good time. And 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 but I'm a masakanalo, so the so so the so what And uh, sorry about all the uh, the switching of the media from Google no, Meet to uh, Instagram. No problem. I love it. Um, first off, I just want to say, if you haven't read Game of Thrones, you have to read the book. I feel like, have you read the book? I have not, and I usually do the book first. I'm usually a book guy before a film guy. Like, like I'm gonna keep it short. And I, I don't understand why they had to create the TV series because the book by itself would have lasted on ten years, you know, even more than that, twenty, thirty years, because it is so much detail. And then what you said about you know good people, bad people, the semi villains, manam nigger, it just takes it all around. That they just, it's just so rich. And um, I feel like the the TV series did not do the book justice. And now, hopefully, you read it, and now you get more out of it. <laughs> she, um, short thing, you know. The other is, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I've never had an interview before, especially uh, concerning my art. So this is the first time I've ever done it. So thank you. <laughs> like this is such a huge milestone for me. Um, another thing would be, um, I would urge my African brothers, African artists, uh, visual artists, writers, um, any sort of art to um, think of how they can benefit the society. You know, like, I feel like art right now is in the time where we use it as a means of luxury but more of as a tool to um, change the being of our brothers, you know, that are, you know, living in the lines, under the lines of poverty. Um, it's, it's, it's our responsibility to um, use whatever gift we're being given um, to make a huge impact. Um, there was this um, one Nigerian man I'd met a couple of years back. And um, there's one thing that, has always constantly lived with me. And he's like, um, unless you're creating impact, you're just worthless. You know, like, especially as an African, you, we have to create impact on our brothers and sisters. We have to change our lives. It is our responsibility. Another guy, let's, let's just do that. Stop doing abstract stuff. Stop doing luxury stuff. Let's create it. We can do this. If... If, if, if what I'm saying uh, wasn't important, Hollywood wouldn't have been what it is right now. You know, the reason why it's still there is because it's changing the way people think. Let's use that. We have the tools. We have the means. I know it's difficult. Oh my God, let's do that. That's what I want to say. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Again, I don't know. But I'm um, sorry. Beautiful. When I was a university sponsored debater, there were two words we focused on all the time and they're related. And it's exactly what you just said. It's impact and magnitude. Whenever we we're weighing people's arguments, we'd say, okay, that's a good argument and all that. But like you said, what is the end goal? What's the teleos? What's the meaning, the purpose, the, the impact and the magnitude? Who is it affecting? So it's, it's so funny that uh, you were raised back home, I was raised here, but in in some way, we had very similar lives. Uh, we're both <laughs> engaged right now. We both grew up on sci-fi and fantasy and are, are uh, loving the, the books and the films and wanting to review it. it it's very fascinating. And I think it might be an Ethiopian ethos that, uh, that guided us, but also I think so. isolation, the, the American Hollywood influence uh, yeah. You're in the belly of the beast of uh, of the Ethiopian side. I'm in the belly of the beast of Hollywood, and uh, we, we're we're drawn by by both of those uh, sources. And so it, it's been really great. So thank you so much. And now, Danahun salamim yadil lahagarachin Ethiopia, Amerika. Amen, amen. Thank you. Bye.